you so much to everyone who's already submitted their projects, either in person or online. If you want to submit it online, the very official process for that is just emailing it to me. Okay. <laughs> it can be a Google Drive link, it can be, I don't know, whatever you need it to be, right? Like that's fine, we'll work through it. Um, if something's come up and you need a little bit of extra time, please just uh, reach out and uh, we can figure out something that'll work. Um, okay, everybody, this is a check-in on your projects. It's okay. <laughs> Our goal here is just to like gently hold your hand and be like, great job, gold star on these parts, silver star on these parts, here are some recommendations, right? Like that's the entirety of what this process is. As someone who uh, is quite competitive and only likes gold stars, I know that will be hard for some of you. Silver is still worth something, you guys. Um, okay, so it's fine. So um, just that's gonna be our note on the project, Lynn. Okay, before we get started with man, um, I passed out a, a piece of paper that says intern informa internship information survey. At the very end of today, 12 to 12.30, we're gonna start a series of small group sessions talking about your internship, which is gonna be here before you know it. And what we'd like is we want to
and they're because of us. The minute you put your spade into the soil, you have opened it up and any little weed seed that was there sees the sun, gets the rain, and is happy to grow. So it's kind of a, I don't know, is it ironic, is it poignant? <laughs> Our desire to have beautiful flowers or lovely vegetables or a terrific tree open up the area for our opponent to sneak in. Now, I'm gonna first start with a little bit of puff about weeds. Are they a weed or are they a wildflower? Dip people will have different ideas about this. There has been, lately it seems to me, kind of a, what do they call it, rehabbing or whatever of dandelions. You know, dandelions were the classic horrible weeds. But now, it's been pointed out how much nectar and pollen they bring in. Um, so if you're a wildlife enthusiast, you see a weed as an advantage. The wild violets. If you're running a golf course, no. But, you know, if you like fritarillia, well, <laughs> yeah, those butterflies, you're odd. This is great. Are they always invasive exotics? Sure. Japanese honeysuckle, which is also a lovely plant, it provides a lot of nectar, but it's an invasive honeysuckle. Virginia buttonweed is a native, and it will eat up a lawn. <coughs> so a plant, again, a weed in a context. You can't always say that they're all invasive. You can't always say that they're not natives.
me wearing clean clothes and a big hat with a basket on my arm and some big flowers and tomatoes. As time has gone by, I appreciate that there's a certain element, and that is true, there's a little of that, but that's certainly, there's a lot more of the Sopranos when it comes <laughs> to work. All right. Using what's there, it's free. I appreciate, and some of these things have really excellent um, nutritional value. But I'm too lazy to pick the little leaves off of a chickweed and put it into my salad. I'm sorry. There's a bag, and I can open that up, right? Okay. Um, this is in your book. I don't need to read it to you or go over it. But again, you have to know what it is. So, um, and some of the ways it can damage you are really quite um, vivid, I guess is a good way to say it. The um, extension gardener plant toolbox, have you all looked at that? It's really got some terrific stuff in there. I mean, really good. It kind of explains the toxicity of things. It's, um, I, I refer to that a lot. And don't forget to go to the poison center. Remember, I think this has probably been covered many times. If somebody calls you and says, I think I've eaten a poison weed, you just get them to the poison center. You don't do legal, you don't do medicine. Yikes. All right. Part of this contest between us and the weeds, it's a pretty even playing field. Weeds got nothing else to do except grow and reproduce and grow. We have lots of other things to do, but we also know more about them than they know about us. And so we're now going, I'm now going to introduce you to the weeds. What's important about knowing the life cycle is that you can find a vulnerability point, all right? Winter annual, which is what we have now. Summer annuals, which we will be getting. Biennials and perennials. Um, and perennials, of course, you probably already know because you're already planting ornamental plants daylilies, whatever. Um, I can't grow daylilies, so it's just a moment of silence for the lack of daylilies in my Those deer. Um, all right. Uh, the annuals work like any other annual, like cosmos, like zinnias, like marigolds. They come up from seed, they, they grow, they're pollinated, they produce seeds, and then they die. Uh, they die in the winter, they will die from when it starts to get warm, in the summer they will die when it starts to get cold. Um, perennials and biennials, they're different because they invest, whereas annuals invest a lot of time in the seed production, perennials and biennials invest a lot of time in growing their roots and their structures underground. Um, that makes them a more daunting uh, a kind of a, a weed to eradicate. An annual, done. But a perennial, part of it is remembering that they're resilient and they're tough. If you break part of a, uh, if you don't get the entire underground structure, that stuff will regrow. So that's why nutsedge, for example, is really tough to get eradicate because there's so many little two, uh, what, yes, tubular? What are they? We'll get to it. I've forgotten what the name of it is. All right. They're getting pollinated, they're gonna set seed, 
And then as soon as it genuinely gets warm, they're going to die. And that seed is just going to sit in the soil until next fall. And then the flip happens with the summer things, right? They're going to bloom in the summer. They're going to get pollinated. They're going to set seed. Once it gets really cold, they're going to die. This is with the annuals. Here are some pictures. Bittercrest chickweed, hence that horsey. And there are more. This is mouse ear chickweed, if you can see it. You can tell that because it's fuzzy. There's also common chickweed. That's the one that everybody eats or some people eat or, you know. Um, Bittercrest, kind of one of my favorites just because. You know Bittercrest? is a tiny little rosette and it has these little white flowers and then it gets pollinated right away and then it has seed capsules and they're really clear and you can see them and you brush them and the seeds explode. Oh, yeah. I just, you think of plants as static and boring but they explode which now you know you've got more bitter crust in your uh, <laughs> Still kind of fun. You know. um, there are some, they're broad and there are grasses, and we'll get to that, but this should be a review kind of from botany when you did monocots and dicots. But just remember that there are annual bluegrass, annual ryegrass. Um, at our house, we're just happy to have grass. We kind of don't really care, but we live out in the county. We don't have an HOA. We don't have neighbors close by getting upset with us. I'm just happy to have earth covered, but I don't mind losing some of the Summer, just kind of the flip, all right? Right now, they're starting to grow. The, we, the seeds are starting to germinate. Yesterday, okay, so we have a lawn care service. Just because my husband Dave, my better half, he does grasses and trees, and I do everything else. I wouldn't pay for it, but he does. So that, I mean, he mows it, so that's his deal. So anyway, they came out and sprayed. They sprayed pre-emergent for the summer leaves. I'm not thinking that far ahead, but they are. Um, here are some of the, the, uh, the um, uh, weeds that grow in the summer. You know mulberry weed? Yeah. That's, I generally can find something nice to say about many weeds, but not mulberry weed. And mainly because it reflects badly on me. The first time I saw that, I thought, oh, that's kind of cute. I wonder if that's a native. I wonder if that's a happy little plant. And I ignored it. Whew. Everywhere I look, I have mulberry weed. Um, again, here are some of your summer annuals with broad leaves and grasses. Japanese stilt grass. Do you know the story of that? <laughs> it is easy to pull out. Um, they, they kind of believe that it arrived in this country in Tennessee in 1919. I know that because I just looked it up last night. 1919 it, it showed up. It had been used in Japan as a packing material. And they had packed porcelain in it. So somebody orders porcelain in Tennessee. The porcelain arrives. They throw out the packing. And there were seeds still viable, such that we now have the Japanese stiltgrass crop. It's a it's something to ponder, you know, Japanese stiltgrass versus uh, star plastic styrofoam. I don't know. It's an interesting uh, dilemma, I think. All right. Biennials. There aren't that many biennial weeds. There are some. Biennials are kind of unusual. Um, you know them from hollyhocks, foxgloves. They know that in the ornamental world. I didn't, I had not appreciated that um, a lot of vegetables and herbs are actually biennials. But uh, Queen Anne's lace is the one you'll see a lot. I don't know bull thistles. I, do, yeah, do we have them here? I've been lucky to have skipped the thistles. Um, Queen Anne's lace is a cool thing. Uh, a lot of people like it as a wildflower. If you ever look at it, I don't know if you ever look at the in the center, there's usually a dark, a dark petal or something. It's really kind of cool, um, fun to look at closely. All right, perennials. Again, they work like your perennials. They work like everybody's perennials. Some of them are from seed. I wrote this down. Which one are simple perennials? Sorry. 
uh, dandelions and broadleaf plantains. Those are simple perennials. They're perennials, but they do produce a lot of seeds. Do you know broadleaf plantain? Um, broadleaf plantain is interesting for two reasons. It, it's, it's an exotic, it's an invasive exotic. It, uh, when uh, colonists came, the indigenous people called broadleaf plantain the white man's footsteps because everywhere the colonists came in, broadleaf plantain came in as well, and it just came building. Forage, you know, the, for the, uh, what was brought for the, um, the animal, the cattle, so on and so forth. I lost my train of thought there. Um, the other thing about broadleaf plantain is if you get stung with a bee or something, if there's plantain around, you crush the leaf and put it on your, put it on the bite and it will help relieve the pain. Sorry, Nan, did you say yeah. that's for any broadleaf? I didn't hear that. Broadleaf plantain. Oh, plantain, yeah. yeah. That's what nutsedge is, bulbs, stolons with the white clover. Um, I'm going to show you a picture. Virginia buttonweed. Okay, this one I just, I find no redeeming value to it at all. Not only are there fleshy roots, but there are underground flowers. I don't understand how that works, but apparently there are underground flowers. Jeez. Now you see a picture of what this is. Okay, like up there, there's your basic annual. Eradicating that, that's simple. But all of the rest is you need to get all these parts of it, or most of them anyway, especially when you get to the tubers, the little one there, the little <coughs> really all over the place. So this is why perennial weed eradication takes a little more effort. All right. Now, um, where am I? Oh, yeah, there. Okay. This is what you need to do to, you need to have a schedule. And a lot of places print calendars of how you handle weeds. So you, you're, you know, you're set. Last time I did this talk was in October. And last time I looked at it, I thought, oh, you know, I should have switched the slides around. But actually, this is kind of an interesting point. It's point number two, which is about pre-emergence. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But right now, out in the landscape around here, you have a lot of winter annuals growing. If the person who is, or the people or in your home, which maybe you have weeds, perhaps you don't. Um, if you have, if you have uh, winter growing weeds, you want to put down the pre-emergence in the fall. Now, for me, I'm thinking about a season ahead. I'm not thinking about, a, you know, six months from now. The lawn care people do, and that's why they get out there and put a count, you know, they have, they come out and do their work for you. But if you have a bed right now that is full of all kinds of winter annuals and you don't want them, put a note on your calendar that in late September, early October, you can put out a pre-emergent and it should quell most of it. This took me a long time to kind of wrap my head around it because, you know, I, you know, I should take a picture of the weeds that I have now and then say, look at this in October, but I never do that. But this is why we're planners and weeds just grow. And this is one of our kits. This is one of the tools that we have in our kit that we know more than they do and we can tell them ahead of time. Um, Stabbers, lawn work. What is the problem with this? That it stops all seeds? Yes. All seeds? It stops all seeds. Mm -hmm. This is true in the summer as well. Um, I have butterfly weed, you know, which is a milkweed, and I want that milkweed to scatter about. If I put a pre-emergent on that bed, then it's done. The other thing about pre-emergent, we'll get to this later, but um, you have to do your timing right. Right? Putting down a pre-emergent, oh man, you're in the middle of July and you thought about all that henbit. Well, that's pointless. I mean, there's nothing to stop there because there's no seeds germinating at that point. Um, these, again, are in, in the manual. We don't really need to go over this too much unless you have any questions about it. Um, don't pile up mulch. You've probably heard this already. Uh, spring now, like I say, the lawn people, they came out and put down pre-emergent on our grass. 
Um, and, but that will stop any Xenians that you hope to that recede, any Cosmos that you hope to recede. So um, there's an interesting in, in the book they talk about hand reading. Now, personally, I like hand reading, um, uh, killing things by hand. You know, I, I, <laughs> there is a certain <laughs> you can say goodbye. You know. <laughs> into the roots, into the plant, I'm just going to keep pulling it up. It's long, it's tedious. Again, if you're into torture, um, it's kind of a nice way to keep going after those weeds. It's also, um, oh, we'll get to this later. Uh, okay, hand pull or kill them before they flower. Your hand bed, again, really nice. But if, if you don't want hand bed next year, you need to get it now. Right? Because it's flowering, we'll go out and look and see if there are pollinators. It's going to set seed. Um, this is my theory on um, I can be lazy for a really long time and not deal with my crustacean, for example, because I know it will not set seed until like September. So I can kind of gamble on maybe it's not going to be miserably hot early in the morning in August and I can go and pull it all up then. <laughs> but once I see a weed seed, then I'm done. Or a seed head, then I'm, then I'm sunk. Then I've let it go too long. And this is true right now. For anything that's blooming in your, in your yard right now that you don't want to keep, go pull it up now if it's blooming. Stop that seed cycle. All right. Um, why is it so hard to win? Well, once again, they have nothing else to do. Okay? And they do put out a lot of seed. There's a lot of seed. And they also will stay viable for a long time. That's the seed bank. That's kind of the example of the microstesium in 1919. It's in some kind of a shipping crate. It leaves Japan. It's on a steamer or a rail or whatever. It gets here. It gets to Tennessee. It's got to be three or four months. And yet you, oh, they opened it up, pitched out the stuff. And now we have microstesium everywhere. Plant seeds can last an awfully long time. There's a lot of ways that seeds get to you. Um, do you know finger ticks? Do you know those? Like little Velcro bits, little little triangle Velcros. If you walk through a weedy field, you'll get them all over you on your socks and your dog and your cat and whatever. Yeah. So they move anywhere. Also, sometimes you can get them in, especially if it's free topsoil or it's free mulch. And even purchased plants, you know, I mean, that's just a danger. Those things sit out, you know. Um, just be mindful. Just keep an eye on whatever you buy if you're not really sure. Of course, because you all have pristine environments and you can't 
which go to adverse conditions. This is the thing that's kind of cool about weed. How many times have you seen a little weed growing in the middle of concrete? I mean, it's incredible. Um, but you can use that to tell you a little something about your, your situation. The, the Virginia buttonweed that's growing in our, I know it's because it's damp and moist and it doesn't drain well. And that's where it grows. Uh, the hydrocotyls, I mean, right there, it's kind of in your name. It's a hydrocotyl that's in the damp area. Flora's there. Mosses, which are not weeds, because flora can Mosses are so cool. You've given your talk, right? You've given your spiel. I have to say, you know, moss is growing. People hate that, but they are so well adapted to their location. And some of them are so beautiful. This is a case where I would make a feature out of a problem, but I'll let Flora carry the. <laughs> All right. That's moist soil. Compacted soil. Spurge is what really grows in all of my concrete. Yeah. Again, these others here. Now, this isn't, this isn't, um, you know, sign seal the This isn't an absolute um, uh, telltale. But it, it gives you a little bit of a, a heads up, perhaps. Um, dry, they're opportunistic. They'll grow anywhere. They go into places where no one else wants to be. Um, hi, does anybody ever do plant succession? I don't know if that's covered, but, and I know very, very, very little about it. But you have like pioneering plants and then that breaks the ground for other plants to come in. It's, um, pardon me. It's like if you have a, um, an empty lot, you will get a, over time, you'll get a, road, a, a succession of different kinds of plants growing in there. It's kind of a cool thing, but you can see a dry soil, this fills it up. The more things you cover the soil, when it rains, when they die, you're adding organic matter. The soil improves because of the winds, and that's how it works. All right. Weed ID, or really, plant ID. Um, I think the plant ID apps are just incredibly cool. How many people have used them? Sorry, Amanda, what was it again? Plant ID apps. On the phone, yeah. They are just incredibly cool. And so many of them are built from like citizen scientists. So that's another really neat thing that people are out there looking at that stuff. Uh, I think of, and I, I, they're great. I think of the plant ID apps as kind of the way I think about our dishwasher. Um, <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> so I can wash dishes by hand, and I often do, because there are some dishes that just need to be washed by hand. But, by hand. but the dishwasher washes them, and they do it, and it does a great job, and it does it for most of the stuff that's going, that, that most of the stuff that we use. But because I wash dishes by hand, I know when the dishwasher isn't doing a good job. I know when I put the wrong thing in the dishwasher because I have the knowledge of just general dishwashing dish dogs. I don't know what the word is. All right. I I would never give up a weed or a plant ID app because it's just there's so many plants out there. There's no way anybody can keep all this stuff in their head. But knowing some basic <coughs> plant ID skills. Um, is sort of a good general knowledge for a gardener to have. It also sharpens your powers of observation, which I think is something that sometimes the screen can get in your way. Again, why I like to pull weeds by hand. Okay, um, if you're using a mechanical means, pulling, hoeing, cultivating, to get rid of weeds, do you need to know its name? You don't. You just know you don't want it, then it's gone. But if it's a perennial or a biennial weed, then you know that just pulling it up is not gonna solve your problem necessarily. And that's why having a little bit of information helps. Um, and when you're doing chemicals, you've got to know what the, you've got to know what the weed is. This is the easiest, of course, if there are flowers. That's the nice one. Uh, do you know Greenbrier? Uh, yeah, Ooh. nasty thorns. 
really nasty. Um, milky sap, which is kind of cool. Some of that is, some of that is latex, isn't it? Yes. Like uh, in World War II, didn't they grow, was it milkweed that they used? I think they grew to, to get latex because rubber was hard to get. So cool things that plants do. Square stems, a dead giveaway for mints, for, for all sorts of weeds. And then your standard things, which you knew from botany and, and fourth grade. All right, again, this is gonna be a review. Um, you have monocots and dicots. A monocot is, don't you? <laughs> what is a monocot? Grass. 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 Right. Also, grasses, sedges, and rushes. What's the key for sedges? Have edges. Sedges have edges. They're triangular. It's the coolest thing. If you ever get to see a sedge, you look at it, it's just really neat. I mean, how many triangle things occur in nature like that? Um, dicots, broadly. Um, uh, the parallel veins and the netted veins, those are a lot of times a giveaway, not always, but that's a giveaway. Um, are, do you know spiderworts, transtangular? Spiderworts are monocots. And next time you see one, take a look at it. Take a look at the leaves and you can really tell that that's, it, it's, it's sort of a, a, a sign of that. Um, uh, Asiatic dayflower, you know that weed? It's a beautiful blue, it's a beautiful blue flower. And you, there aren't so many really clear blue flowers. Yeah, it's a weed, but it's also a monocot. I would look for that in the summer if you find it. I, I, I let them go way too long. This is, if you've seen this or something very similar to it, I have to say, um, kind of, as a librarian, as sort of a word person, I don't know, do you guys do Wordle? You know, yeah. you're sort of a word, all right. You're kind of a word nerd. I am just endlessly fascinated by all the very specific names for these very specific plant parts. It's, the vocabulary is vast. Um, I know about 10 that I can just say with some degree of ease. But when you think about in the early days of plant descriptions, when all you had was somebody who could illustrate or somebody who had to describe it, this is how everybody communicated back and forth. Well, the node is here and the internode is there. Okay, that, you know, that's just over here now. But it's such a rich, it's such a rich discipline, you know, if you think about it. It's just such a cool thing little hard now. Grasses, grasses are um, fascinating really. Um, I, I just barely started kind of trying to understand grasses. I'd like to tell you that it's because I'm a sophisticated person and I'm now looking for the more and more aesthetic uh, and, and, and subtle the truth is that the deer like the same flowers that I like, and so they also like the same pretty foliage that I like, and so I'm kind of stuck with grasses as something that I'm gonna use everywhere that I can, but make a virtue out of a, out of a trouble. And <coughs> anyway, these hairy or not, it's just, it's really, it's just so many, it's so interesting to me how many variations a plant will have developed something out there. Um, sedges, there we go. Here's a little bit more about them again. Triangular, solid stems. And they always have a very distinctive looking flower at the top. And tubers. So, <coughs> I wrote it down. Kalinga. Kalinga? Kalinga? The green thing. Um, there's a fragrant one. I don't know if any of you have run across this, but when I pull weeds, every now and again, I'll get one of these. It's bright, 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 bright green, kind of little. And when you pull it up, it has just an amazing fragrance. And I always say, this is lovely, you know, but. <laughs> but also there are ornamental sedges, which is carrots, which you'll, uh, a lot of times people will see it as an ornamental grass, but it's a carrot. 
and it's just, again, triangle, so it's kind of neat. All right, apparently you've already done some uh, IPM, so this is just gonna be really um, a review. I'm sure they're all lovely people, but they don't need more. And it's nice to think of other ways to approach a problem as opposed to doing the chemicals. Not the chemicals won't solve intractable problems. And I gotta tell you, when I find poison ivy, I have no compunction in just drowning it in glyphosate. But <laughs> I do try to be a little management. Now this is just basic, just basic best gardening practices, right? Right plant, right place. You have a healthy, thriving plant in a good place. The ground, you know, it's, you don't disturb the ground. Once the plant is established, then the, the seeds don't have a place to get to perch. Uh, plant friendly seeds, all of this kind of stuff. Uh, again, free, if it's free, give it some thought. But this is just setting the stage. Mechanical, this is person versus weed, right? This is hands dirty, you and the weed. This is pulling weeds, um, the hose, cultivators, whatever it is that you, you, uh, you want to use. Um, mulches, why do mulches work? Because it deprives the, the seed of sunlight. Ground covers, you shade it out. You can plant your plants close together. If you plant them close together, it's shaded the soil. There's a lot less place for a weed seed because it just needs that little bit. But if you deprive it of that, you don't have any more, well, you have fewer weeds. Um, now, they are, they point out the drawback to hand weeding. And this is a fair point. And I yank it up because I do it with gusto. You know, I break the soil and I've opened it up. I've opened up the soil and any little weed seed that was sitting down there from last year, it's got a chance. So, you know, subtlety is a, is a virtue when it comes to this. You don't have to just yank it up. Also, you can hand weed and then cover with mulch, which helps you there. Um, solarizing, I tried solarizing once. Has anybody tried it? The what? Solarizing. How did, how did it go? I do it often, actually, with a, like a silage part. Oh, really? So, uh, is that what you mean by solarizing? Well, you know, a lot of times they just talk about you open up an area, you put clear plastic on it, you let the uh, August sun just eat I it. I use it. black plastic. Black, oh, uh, okay. Heavy, heavy black plastic, or I'll just put cardboard around. Yeah, that's more of like a, 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 a mulch kind oh, of thing with the yeah. cardboard. I've done that lasagna, the lasagna gardening they talk about. Um, solarizing, yeah. Speaking of black plastic, you have a black widow question. <laughs> <laughs> black plastic and created a black widow, as she said. So, yeah. you know, at least, at least it matched, right? Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I tried it, I, and but I only did it. I only did it once, and I assume that you know, if you're skilled, you can do a better job. Meh. Okay, this is my favorite. I would love to go watch somebody do this. I just, you know, I mean, we're cat people, but you gotta admit, goats are kinda cool. Um, and this was down at the, the Chapel Hill Public Library. So, that's about it, though. I mean, you know. Um, yeah. Unless you get their poop as fertilizer. Uh-oh. There you go. And that's, uh, you know, poop is, um, speaking of poop, um, you know, Beth, have you ever seen the chicken tractors? Yeah. You ever seen that? That's such a, that's a kind of a cool, um, a couple of agents ago here, horticultural agents, uh, Paul McKenzie did a, a chicken tractor and he was like describing it, he's like, that is just darn weird. But the more you think about it and the kind of the advantage of the chickens eating the insects and the seeds and then pooping and then you just keep moving it around and you've got this lovely fertilized area, in theory. <laughs> All right, chemical is something, um, <coughs> a 
again, better living through chemistry. Chemistry and chemicals have just done so many great things. We, we just, you know, there's, there's no point in trying to be completely dismissive of, the, of what chemistry does. However, we certainly know that the damage that it will do, and it will do a lot of damage, and more is not better, and all of this stuff costs money. As master gardeners, you serve a number of people in the community who come from everywhere, and not everybody's got a lot of money, so that's the other part that gets me is, depending on how big of an area that you have, you know, you buy, I don't know, a pint of something, and you spray it three times, and then it sits on the shelf and just degrades. It's, it's a hazard. I think that chemistry should be used intelligently and sparingly, but boy, if you need it, as I say, poison ivy, you know, there's nothing, nothing's gonna beat it. Um, always read the label, always know what you're, what you're killing. And there's some, like I said, there's some really great stuff in the manual that kind of spells out how all this stuff works. I, I'm not a chemist through person, and just me reading the screen is not at all interesting. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the, there's the four terms that you kind of have to know. You really have to think about to get clear in your head what it is. Selective, non-selective, contact, and systemic, because you can have variations of these, and it's good to know what they are. Selective, it will only pick certain things. Some chemicals will kill broadleaf, some will kill grasses. That's non-selective, anything. Glyphosate. And you want to be careful. You can kill a lot of stuff in a really quick minute. Contact. That will kill what it hits. All right. It may most likely only kill the top of it. When I put boiling water, flamethrower, say, or flamethrower. <laughs> See, all right, it kind of revealed that. <laughs> Putting down a pre-emergent in July is 
pointless. Putting it down in December is probably pointless. I, um, there's an area that, an isolated uh, bit of, well, dirt with some grass is really what it is. And we're sort of thinking of putting clover in just to see how that would work. So I caught the guy who was putting out, who was spraying yesterday, and I told him to leave that alone because one of the things he's putting down is pre-emergence. And I'm, what I'm not sure about, and so I just erred on the side of caution, was I'm not sure if his pre-emergence that he would put down would impact my clover seeds when I put it down next month. I'm not sure, it may or may not, because there's also sort of a barrier, it's kind of a, a chemical barrier. So if we were to like aerate that area and then put the seeds down, the pre-emergent might not have impacted it. <clears throat> but uh, just think about how kind of really cool that is. It just stops everything. You know this. Uh, times for post emergence, after it's up, again, onto the foliage. Um, yeah. I don't use a lot of chemicals, but the ones I do, boy. Whoop. All right. Yeah.
could be fixated on it, yeah. Um, I'm not used to printing. I, I, I bought it. it. It's probably useless now because it's probably six years old. I always thought I was going to because the other one is, is Bermuda grass, which is just yikes into my bed. But has anybody had good luck? Dispose of it at the waste area, right, wherever it's, um, Club Boulevard. Take it there to household waste. Take it there. I would never discourage anybody from chemicals if you've got a really serious problem and you don't have time to rent goats. You know, that, and you need that, you know, fine. That's fine. But know what you're doing. And, you know, they read the label. And it's in, you know, what, 0.2 font or something. It's just absurd how small they make it. But you can... You can do a little bit of research, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. It's really, I wouldn't say shocking to me, but it's surprising about how on these labels there's so much information and it's this tiny, yeah. tiny light gray print. And last week we were doing, um, we weren't here, but we were doing a Zoom and then we broke off into these little groups. And so I was talking about a particular that went into doing chemicals. There are so many chemicals that are useful and helpful, but again, we have all seen just what massive pesticides, massive herbicides can do. And so um, I, we want to have profound respect for what that is. And just be careful. All right. Virginia Tech has a really good weed ID um, uh, uh, website. It's a lot like NC State's as well, where you click off characteristics and then it narrows <coughs> down what your weed is. The nice thing about doing weed ID, which kind of gives you skills in plant ID, is that you know you can yank a weed up out of the out of the ground, bring it into your computer, and just start keying in what you see. It's kind of an easy way to practice those skills. Um, there are, on the back of the very back of it, there is an illustrated glossary of um, leaf, what is it? leaf shapes. But it's
it's more than leaf shapes, it also has habit and so on. That's kind of a nice thing to just have, so it's good to have it there on that sheet. I really, um, anyway, I, there's just really some cool stuff about these. Now, have you seen this? <laughs> yeah, believe me, actually I'll give you one with no trouble. Have you seen this? Have you seen that? <laughs> All right. This is the North Carolina Agricultural Chemical Manual. Now, again, there are incredibly smart people who wrote, who found out all of the information that's in here. Table after table after table of what a chemical will do, what it's good for, what it's not good for. This is for professional applicators. I think farmers use it. Ashley reads it every night, you know. <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> so I just want to say, because this is just who I am, I read it for you. Um, <laughs> and what I have here are the highlights <laughs> of the North Carolina Agricultural <laughs> Manual. <laughs> Thank you. 